continuing on with the TMCC Library uh, Open Genealogy Lab Outstanding Guest Speaker Series, today we are pleased to present Amanda Skellinger. Amanda is the manager at the Genealogy Center for the Museum of Danish America in Elkhorn, Iowa. She studied library and information sciences with a concentration in archive management at Simmons University in Boston, Massachusetts. Prior to this position, she was an assistant librarian in a public library and spent 10 years as a teacher librarian in a K through 12 school district. Today's session will introduce viewers to the Museum of Danish America's Genealogy Center in Elkhorn, Iowa, and then provide an overview of our research process, describe the main sources we use for both US and Danish records, and demonstrate how to access and use some of those sites and databases. There are three handouts for today's session, uh, five of our most used free websites for Danish research, typing tips for Danish research, and on live archive suggestions. So I'd like to offer a warm virtual welcome to Amanda. So welcome to this presentation on the Danish genealogy in the Museum of Danish America. Um, as she said, my name is Amanda Scalinger and I'm the GC manager. I've been here for about two and a half years and it's been an interesting experience. Um, if you are new to Danish genealogy in, or um, any of that, it can be kind of overwhelming, but it's easy to learn. I have no Danish heritage or background and I actually picked it up quite quickly so it is doable um, you just have to learn a few terms and then it's pretty repetitive um, so we are located in Elkhorn Iowa we are obviously under the umbrella of the museum of Danish America but we are not located at the museum Instead, we have our own physical space that's located on Main Street in Elkhorn, um, while the museum is on the western outskirts of the town. We are open uh, Tuesday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., both to walk-in visitors and by appointment. You can also find us online. We have a Facebook group that anybody is welcome to join. Um, we created it basically to give people a place to ask questions, post you know, successes or frustrations, offer help, uh, share articles, links, um, things like that. It's basically just a place to talk to like-minded people or to share and get ideas or help um, while working on their genealogy. Um, these are the services we currently provide. In addition to providing the full research service where we do all of the work, we also offer collaborative research with those who want to be more hands-on in finding their family. Um, when visitors do come in, they are welcome to use one of the patron computers where we provide, or they can bring their own laptops to work with. Uh, working in our facility grants them access to our Ancestry and newspaper.com accounts. And then the patron computers provide additional access to our in-house databases and indexes and those kinds of things. Um, there are fees that the services are subject to, but if you are a museum member, then those rates are reduced. For translations, we charge by the hour, and then for the research, we have recently moved to a package format. But if you want something simple like a passenger list, it, or we house the Danish Brotherhood um, membership information. If you want some, a copy of that for your ancestor, then we, we can charge by the hour. So we're flexible. Um, if anybody is interested in any of those services, um, to access the research and translation request forms, uh, if you go to our museum web website, which is the danishmuseum.org, under the Explore tab at the top, there's a genealogy section. You would just need to click on the research and translation link there and then the page um, that comes up will have the forms you need to fill out and submit. And then it also has other information about what you need to send in and then other fee information. So now that we've covered that basic information, um, I'm just kind of going to show you what we what you'll find if you come here. Um, Pictured here is an overview of the genealogy center. We are a small facility, but we do have a lot of information. And this is actually a little virtual tour that I'm going to take you on. So, let me get this full screen. 
Okay, so when you first come in, we do have an exhibit area. And this exhibit area is focal, focused on all local and regional history. So it mainly focuses on um, kind of the Tri-County, Elkhorn, Kimbleton, what we call the Danish villages, um, and then Iowa Midwest stuff. And then up here, this is a photo of uh, a Danish college that used to be in Elkhorn. It was one of, well, it was the first Danish folk school in America, and it was established in 1878. Eventually, this was closed down and it kind of migrated to Blair, Nebraska, and it eventually became Dana College. And then Dana just closed down, I think, in 2010. So then we come in through here. And over here, right here, these first two stacks are our family histories. This is information that families have done and bound in a book or binder, and they have donated to us. And we have cataloged it and put it on our shelves in our family history section. So this um, shelf and the one behind it are just family histories. Over here in this section is just your two typical Dewey nonfiction. Um, but it's basically kind of revolves around the immigrant experience or Denmark and um, America and that kind of stuff. Over here, we have our obituary collections. This is national. Um, so we do get people that send in obituaries and then we collect from different um, publications like the Danish Pioneer and some of those others. And then these little ones down here are all local um, obituaries from the local papers. And those go back to the early or the late 1800s. On the other side of this um, column is our Danish Brotherhood materials. Um, we have kind of the microfilms and then the Danish American Archive and Library also has um, Brotherhood materials. And that's located in Blair, Nebraska. They're kind of our sister institution. So a lot of times if we don't have something, they'll have it. And if they don't have it, we'll have it. Over here is Iowa demographic information, like uh, church records, birth death stuff for different counties. Most of this stuff is all the counties that have a large Danish population. So Shelby County, Audubon County, um, Blackhawk. Um, so it's not the entire state, it's just the ones that have the most Danish populations. Um, I'm gonna come over here. So these two shelves, right, or through this information right through here is um, regional information. So, but it focuses on Danish communities. So here you would find books about genealogy or communities in Montana, like the history of Dagmar, Montana or um, Solvang, California. And then this last one is the same type of information, but it's from Denmark. So you get the county information from Denmark or the histories from Denmark. They are in English and then these are in Danish. These are our patron computers. Um, and this, these file cabinets are our um, immigrant files. So all the research that we do, we keep a copy and we put them in our immigrant files. And we also, in collaboration with a program up at the um, museum called the Wall of Honor, individuals can purchase a plaque in honor of their immigrant that came over. And everybody who's on the wall of honor also has an immigrant file. And then occasionally we get families who will donate information, but it's not enough to put in a book. So we create a file, but everybody in here is an immigrant. They're all born in Denmark and they came over and there's over well over 10,000 names in here. There's this file cabinet and then it continues into this next room in the other, in, through the store. And we have just actually started a project a 
couple months ago and we're starting to digitize these because right now they're just in paper form. So we're hoping to get these all digitized and then either an index that's searchable online or you know have the actual files somehow searchable and accessible online. We haven't quite got that far, but our main priority right now is getting these digitized. And then here's that information. Oops. Back here is our microfilm machine and then our microfilm, um, this is vital records from Iowa, that kind of stuff. And then we also have Danish Brotherhood um, ledger information and rosters. Over here, we have periodicals from Danish publications all across the country um, and locally. This area right here is biographies, both English and Danish. And that's also what's over here. And then these are maps and plat maps and that kind of stuff. So we're kind of a small building, but we do have a lot of info in it. So I'm going to pop right back out of there and get back into my presentation. There we go. Okay. So back to the presentation. Uh, now that I've shown you what we have at the building, this is basically our what we start with in our online research. And I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, we do have the paid ancestry account, which is one of those that is accessible to our visitors while they're in the building. Uh, family search is another one that we use daily. Usually we've been lucky enough that if we can't find something on Ancestry, we're able to find it, on, find it on Family Search. And then Find a Grave is the third website, that English website um, that we use regularly. We don't always take the information as verified fact because we do find quite a few ir irregularities, whether it be a date or a, you know, a location. Um, but we do use it to try to verify family members or um, burial locations. And sometimes we do find spouses, you know, if they were married twice we, that we didn't know about or children that we didn't know existed. So we do consider it to be a valuable resource for us. These two sites are not really used by the other researchers, but they are probably my favorite. <laughs> So I personally use them quite often. Um, as you may know, newspapers.com is the largest online newspaper archive available. They have newspapers from the 1700s to recent. Um, you do have to have a paid subscription to access the archive, but if you have an Ancestry account, you can get the subscription as an add-on to your Ancestry account. Um, Advantage Archives, is a newer and smaller newspaper archive that I'm not sure many know about yet. It tends to service the smaller communities. If you can't find your newspaper in um, the newspapers.com, check Vantage Archives. They are constantly adding new communities. Um, the access is free and oftentimes um, these papers are accessible through community libraries or historical societies. Um, that specific link that I have on the screen will take you to a page, the directory page, which is this little map picture that I have up. And you can click on those little place markers and it should take you right to the link of uh, that, that archive for that community. Um, I really think that newspaper archives are important in research because they best basically tell you the story about your people. You know, they give you your people dimension and personality and life. You may also be able to find information about individuals that you really can't find in other records. Um, you know, back in the day, newspapers would post everything. They were kind of like the social media of the day, like the Facebook and the Twitter. Um, they would post everything everybody did. So if you're trying to find maybe a maiden name for a birthplace of, you know, Hans Larson's wife, Anna, 
and then you're going through the paper, local paper, and you see in the community activity page that Mr. and Mrs. Hans Larson went to visit her brother Jens Olson and his family in Omaha. Well, you now know that Anna Larson's maiden name was likely Olson, and she had at least one brother in Omaha, which is a possibility of where she's from too. So if you chase some records on the brother, then you might be able to find some more on the sister that you weren't able to locate before. Um, there are four main Danish websites that we use to research and we are on these daily. The Danish National Archives holds a variety of records and miscellaneous collections, including the vital records, census records and military records. The most important records to us are the church book scans because um, they provide most of the vital records, the birth and baptisms, the death, confirmation, marriage, those things. Um, one thing to note is that this site has an option for being in English so you can read some of the information, but all of the records are gonna be in Danish. Um, the Danish demographic database is used to access the Danish census, uh, which can provide key information on continuing your research. The census records available are from 1769 to 1930. However, they did not take the census regularly, regularly throughout the years, so there are gaps. Um, for example, 1769 is the first one available, and then the next one isn't available until 1787. And then if the county you're looking for is in like the Schleswig-Holstein area, depending on if Germany or Denmark had it at the time, there might not be any census for those years. So just kind of have to be aware of who controlled that area at the time. Um, overall though, this is a useful site and it's user friendly. You can learn where people were born, their occupations, um, and a lot more. Uh, but the key, though, is to use the Danish spellings, which you need to know those special characters. And that's why I kind of included that handout of how to make those special characters, the typing one. Um, the Danish Immigrant Archive is a database that holds the immigration records for those leaving Denmark starting um, after the 19 or the 1860s, excuse me, when people were leaving, they had to register. And this record then had their name, um, birth date, age, ship, name, destination, and more. It usually had that. Sometimes it didn't always, as you can see in this, there was question marks for some, but that's what they usually had. Um, if you are searching for your person in an American arrival passenger list and you aren't quite sure if the one you found is correct, you can cross check with the Danish immigrant record and see if the information matches up and with what you have. So this is also a way to find if people immigrated with one family or with their family members or if they just came alone. Um, you can access this site from the Danish demographic database site um, or from a direct link, um, which this is the, the Danish demographic database site, and then this is the direct link. So it's a longer one, but they both work. Um, in here, I want to kind of point out this, and I just apologize because I'm probably not going to say any these Danish words wrong or right. I'm not very good at that the Skidsnaven, which is the ship's name. If you see the, a name there, that is the name of the ship they sailed on. So this person sailed on the Oscar II. If you see indirect, it means they had an, a stop before they came to America. So there wasn't an indirect passage. There was, so they probably stopped and got on a different ship. So, you know, they could have went to Hamburg and then from Hamburg they came over or Liverpool and then from Liverpool they came over. So it wasn't a straight shot. Um, the last one is uh, Stednaven. Uh, 
and I know I probably didn't say that right. So again, I apologize. This database will help you find the county and the district locations of the communities in Denmark. We mainly use it if we're struggling to find the parish or the counties, and we have to know that that information if we are going to search the church books or the census to find records. Um, so that overall, when we're doing the Danish genealogy, we constantly bounce back and forth between the different databases, you know, finding information in one and then using it to search the others. Most of these sites on the handout I had, you know, included for today. And if you're looking at those handout digitally, you should just be able to click on the name or the icon and it'll take you directly to the site. Um, I also encourage people to visit our website as we have a lot more resources um, and sites listed there. Before I move on to what the rest of the museum has, I kind of want to show you what it looks like when we search those sites and kind of how we start off our research and bounce around. So I'm just, I just want to make sure we have time to do that. So I'm going to get out of here real quick and go to my web pages. You're fine on time, Amanda. You got plenty of time. Oh, okay. Well, why I'm here, I'm just going to do this. <laughs> okay. So let's say I'm searching for Jens, Jens Jensen. I'm going to probably come to this is the Danish demographic database. So this is our census where we come to. But you can also add access the immigrant art um, database right here also. I'm going to go to the census. If I know he was just born in Horing or in, I looked this guy up, so in Beardby, Denmark, and I don't really know a county, I would use the stead name. And so I pull that up. And I bring the stud maven up. And then I would type in and then do a search. This this is all the beard bees in <laughs> or related ones in Denmark. So there's a lot of different beard bees in Denmark. I know though he was from Huring. Since we have threes. It's the one without the E. So this is the one he was in. This is parish, this is district, and then this is county. So we need to know the parish and we need to know the county. So coming back here to census, I do simple search because I just find it, it works a lot better. When you do the advanced searches, I feel like it narrows it down, but you, you can totally do whichever you please. Um, simple search. So you come up and find Huring County. And then typically when I'm searching, I don't always know the district or parish. So I will just do a broad county. Um, if I do know the district or the parish, then I will narrow it down. Because um, if you would happen just to put in Jens Jensen, and you're looking and touring and you don't know the year, you're going to get so many, you know, 5,000 results. That's not realistic. If you know the year, hopefully you do. I do know a year. Even if you put the year in, <coughs> excuse me. Um, we have 376. So if you know the parish and the district, that's that's great. Um, I'm just going to search by parish though. And so this is actually that's not the one that I want. Oh, that's because he was not okay. He was actually living in Torsteven. He's actually living here in 1860, sorry. This is the one I want. I was trying to find the records yesterday and I stumbled upon this gentleman and he was quite interesting. So we're going with him. 
So when you come up with a record, this is all the person you're searching for his information. So you have his address, his house number, information, you know, his name, age, where his birthplace was. So it gives you the parish and the county. The earlier censuses won't necessarily have the birthplace. Um, and even some of the later ones won't have it. So, but most usually do. The position in the house, this is means farmer. And then this is what why I chose it because this is the first time I've ever seen Dan and Bozeman. And I was kind of thrown, I've never heard that before. So I looked it up and that is actually a person who was a member of the Danabrock Order, which is basically kind of a knight and it has to be earned from a queen. So now I really want to do more research on this guy and see why he got this, got this honor. Um, but you see here, here he was born. His wife is Meta Jen's daughter. She's 63. This means he's married, his wife. She was born in Torslev. This is their daughter, Kirsten, Jen's daughter. So they use the patronymic naming system, which is based on the father's first name. So Jen's, if it was a son, it'd be Jensen. But since this is a daughter, it's Jen's daughter. Um, and then this right here, this says foster children. And then this is a servant. But since their last names were Jensen, I kind of started wondering if they weren't maybe her children, because it's kind of odd for a four-year-old to be unmarried. So I decided to look into it just a little bit more. And I decided to go back a year, kind of follow him through the census, and go back a year. And this is how we use the census a lot. We just kind of try to follow them as far as we can back and forward through the census. And so I want to find the, the beard fee. And if I, if I have a huge list of results, I'll do control F and then I'll type in, um, and then it'll pop up all the different matches and it brings me right to um, the one that I want. So here's Jens Jensen again. And you see that he's again a farmer, the Dan and Brogman, and he is the head of the house. So he's and then his wife. And then you see Kirsten Marie again, and she's a weaver. And she's the daughter. And then this is Jen's Christian. He's eight. And he's also listed as their foster son. But the other little one, he's not listed which he's nine here so he should have been about four here so i'm not really sure why he's not here so i'm going to go back one more and you know you can just keep going so going back to the 1851 and then i'm going to find him again and then we find him again and you see uh Pierce Marie, daughter, they have a servant. And then Jens Jensen is their son. So, and then this Kirstine and Neil's daughter is his wife. And then this Jens Jensen and Christian Nikolai, those are their children. So from between 1850, something in 1860, something happened to Jens and Kirsten and they're gone and their kids are now foster kids with the grandparents. So that's a whole lot of records that I now need to find if I'm gonna do um, more information and research this person. So using that, you know, I can go back and find, I have the um, birthplaces, so, I'm gonna come back up here and I'll go to the National Archives. So you wanna go into the parish registers. And this is where you can change it technically to English, but I mean, it'll tell you what it is in English. All you really need to know is you need to come into the Kirkborg 
And then from here, again, you put in the county and then the parish archive. And this is the one I want. And I did the math. And if I wanted to do Jens, he was born around 1777. And so he's in the old books. If we were doing one of the kids or his kids, he would be in one of the newer scans, which these are much better. These are in color and they're divided up. So these are all the death, uh, death records and they're divided by male and female. So these are female, these are male. These are birth and baptism. So these are female, male, confirmation records. And when they got old enough to go work, they would have to change parishes and every time they would register to leave the parish. And that's what these records are. These are when they left the parish and came back. And then these are marriage records. And so, you know, I can go in and find, let's see if I can find Christian. Christian, Christian, 51. Um, wrong one. Boy. Okay, and so then a matter of this is just, you kind of have to bounce around and then look for the date. So I popped into 1849 and then, excuse me, 52. I'm just gonna stop here. But you have the date of um, the birth, you have the name. This is uh, the baptism and if they're baptized at home or in church. These are the um, parents and it usually says, um, their occupation. So this is farmer Lars Christ, Christian Peterson and his wife, Elsa Marie Anders, daughter of Beerby. And then over here, they have witnesses for the baptism. And then this is just a reference for the church. And then these are just some comments or notes it's usually a vaccination when the the child was vaccinated, um, the date. So this looks like 7th of April, maybe. Um, and so that's what the typical birth records look like. Uh, sometimes they can be easier to read. Sometimes they can be kind of hard. Um, if I was looking for gens, I need to go into the old records. These are harder to search for because they are not separated like, like the colored ones. Um, you just kind of have to jump around. As you can see, the green ones are where it was and you just have to kind of start. <laughs> and when you first look at it, you kind of have to <laughs> look close and see what exactly you're looking for. Um, but, you know, they don't tell you necessarily like December or January. It's, you know, Sunday after Trinity. So then you have to figure out when exactly that date is. That the wiki that I gave you on the handout, the Family Search Danish wiki has a list of those dates and what those actually figure out to. So that's how that page is also useful. But, so you just have to kind of bounce around. Um, these are these are birth. Uh, you can see well, they're just not very easy to read. But actually, these aren't as bad as some of I've seen. You can see the father's name is Niels. Not sure what that last name is. Um, if I can see if I when I can read pretty easily. No, nope, not fair. Anyway, you get the idea. You just kind of have to, might have to look a little long and try to figure out what they might say, but you just kind of have to jump around and see what you can find until you find it. Um, down here though, this is where they get nice in the later years. <laughs> they actually start underlining the, the 
kids' names and they might put it in the side so it's easier to find. But it's also important to remember that you did the patronymic naming. So you might find a gens, but then if you look at you know the parent name, you need to know make sure that his name's gens too. Otherwise, you you don't have the right one. Because going through these, I found probably like 10 and not a single one had gens as a parent name. So it might take you a little bit to find. Oh, hey, that could be him, Jen Jensen. Um, and then his wife is Kirsten Jensen's daughter. So this could be my kid right here. Um, and so that's how we use those. And then if I wanted to keep going, I could go through and try to find his confirmation. Confirmation records are usually 14 years after his birth, 14, 15. And then, you know, try to find marriage and just keep on. So that's how we use that. Um, oh, the immigrant database. Let me get out of all these. Um, the immigrant database. Come back here. And that's what this one looks like. And you can change it to be in English. So it's easier to understand. But when you search, you want to search last name first. So Jensen, comma, Jens. And if you happen to know the year, you can put it in. You don't have to. Um, and then just do search. And then you have a lot you get. Jens Jensen is a very common name, so you're going to get a lot anyway. But if you know that he's going to come to, let's say, Omaha, or you know he immigrated in 1888, you can do that control F again to find and type in 1888. And I have oh, only 104 matches. That, and then it'll pop you down to everywhere 1888 pops up and you have St. Paul, Nebraska, so that's closer. And then you just have to go through and try to find the ones that match and then, you know, look and see the last place they live. This was Presto, uh, Scanner Board, or who's their location, uh, their ultimate destination was Wisconsin. Um, here's their age. Sometimes you can look by contract number. Um, lately, that hasn't really been working for some reason, um, but sometimes it also does. So, uh, or you can, let's say, Omaha. If you're looking for a specific place that you know they came to, that also works. Um, I did want to show one more thing, searching for the census. If you don't know how to spell something or there's multiple ways to spell something, you can put in um, a percentage sign and it acts like a wild card. So if I was looking for um, Kirsten, Jen's daughter, and I didn't know if it was C-H-I-R um, or K-I-R, I can do that. And then it will search for any of the different spellings of, for both different spellings. I'm just gonna take the years out. If you have a really unique last name, um, like Wes, we had to look for, uh, we had a project for the last name Wes, which isn't really a common Danish name. You could possibly just put West in and search all the years and see who all comes up, and that could be a way to find families. But as you can see, oh, these are all, this is probably all the same person. I'm going to take that out and do a broad search. I'm probably going to get a lot. Yeah. So you have Kirstein and then K-I-E-R. You got all the different spellings. So that's just something to remember because sometimes they mess up with the spellings in these things too, especially in the older uh, records. 
Jen's daughter turns into Jensen. And then in some censuses, you know, in 1870, it might be Jen's son. And then 1880, it might be Jen's daughter again. So you don't know. Um, and so those are kind of how we use and go back and forth. And if you have any questions at the end about any of that, I'll be happy to answer any questions. But I'm going to pop back into the, the, the presentation now. <laughs> Um, okay. So moving on, um, here's going to be, this is going to be a little um, introduction to our museum uh, here in Elkhorn. Um, and I'll just kind of tell you about what we all have here. This is Beds the Morris House. It's another uh, historical building in Elkhorn that is owned by the museum. And just like the genealogy center, it is not on the museum grounds. It's actually located a few blocks away from here, um, uh, about a block west off of Main Street in the middle of Elkhorn. Uh, it's currently being updated and repainting, getting new windows, just kind of getting a nice rejuice. Um, but it is still open right now and it will be open all summer. The work is about done. so. Uh, and even if it happens to be closed when you come, you can call up to the uh, museum or call ahead and somebody will probably be more than happy to go down there and open it up for you and let you walk through. Um, Beds to Moore's, uh, for just for a little background, it was built in 1908 by Jens Otto J uh, Christensen, who was a Danish immigrant and an Elkhorn businessman. Uh, according to local legend, Jens Otto Christensen loved the young lady in the community, and he actually built the house as an engagement gift for her. But unfortunately, um, she ended up turning down his marriage proposal. Um, no one is quite sure if Jens lived in the house after that, but it was rented and eventually, eventually sold in 1933 to the Salem Old People's Home in Elkhorn and then to Meta Mortensen in 1946. Meta Mortensen, if you haven't guessed, is also of Danish descent. Uh, she lived in the home for 36 years, making very few changes to the house during her years of living there. The roses that she planted along the outside of the house was one of the few additions she added, and they can still be seen blooming today. Uh, Meta sold the house uh, to the Elkhorn Kibbleton Arts and Recreation Council in 1982. After they restored it, they named it the Bedstemore's House in her honor, as Bedstemore means grandmother in Danish. Um, in 1990, the house was deeded to the museum, and on January 16, 1997, it was placed on the National Register of Historic Places. On the north side of the museum building proper, which is, like I said, on the western edge of Elkhorn, there are 30 acres of recreated prairie with native plants, songbirds, butterflies, rolling hills, and walking trails and paths. It was created in honor of Jens Jensen, who is a Danish, was a Danish immigrant that became a well-known and respected landscape architect. Uh, he was an advocate for environmental and conservation, and he was known to incorporate the natural terrain and native plants of an area into his designs. Um, he is also the founder of the Clearing Folk School in Wisconsin, and I believe that is still um, operating today. We have several features on the prairie with these four being the most significant. Um, behind the museum to the north, there is a small homesteader's cabin. It's right behind the museum. Um, and it's called a Jens Dixon cabin. And it was originally located just north of the community of Kenmar, North Dakota, and we brought it down. Um, this is where Jens Dixon first lived when he arrived in America in 1901. Being a school teacher and lame preacher, Jens taught the boys in his house, and in the winter they actually lived with them with, as well. And it's quite remarkable because it's a very amazingly small structure. Um, the wetland area of the prairie underwent an update and restoration last summer which expanded it and cleaned it up a bit. It had originally been created by removing the drain tiles that had previously been used by farmers to drain the excess water from the soil. Um, today, the wetland is providing habitat for frogs, uh, semi-aquatic 
mammals such as muskrats and waterfowl and shorebirds such as Canada geese and killdeer. We have two council rings on the prairie, a large one and a small one. Uh, they are also inspired by a Jens, Dix, a Jens Jensen design element where he would combine elements of an ancient Nordic cultural tradition with the council fires of Native Americans. Uh, the council rings are supposed to be a symbol of democracy and they are intended as a gathering place where all people would be considered equal. And then finally, we have a, the Friends Trail, which is a 0.6 mile paved pedestrian path that runs through the park. In addition to being a great way to just see the prairie and enjoy nature, it connects the museum main building with the Bestemore's house in um, Elkhorn. So it actually goes down and to the town. And then finally, in this little section, I'm going to show you what we have in our new upcoming exhibits we have. This first one is Tattoo Identity Through Ink. Um, it's going to open up in a couple weeks and it will run from May 26th to September 5th. It was curated by Dr. Lars Krutak and organized by Vesterheim, which is the National Norwegian American Museum and Folk School, Folk Art School in Decorah, Iowa. It's sponsored by the Humanities Iowa and Marnie Jensen and Kenny Bogus in Nebraska City, Nebraska. Um, this ex exhibition tells the story of tattoos and the people who have them. The exhibit explores the ways individual and group entities or identities are formed, uh, reinforced, and celebrated through tattoos. Of course, there's a Scandinavian uh, connection with celebrated artists like Norwegian uh, Johan Frederick Knudsen and Norwegian-American Ahmed Dietzel. The question of whether or not Vikings had tattoos and then the rise of the whole modern neo-Nordic style of tattooing. Uh, but the, cult, the exhibition also allows us to explore more deeply the traditions of body ornamentation in other cultures and our connections to them. Um, we will also be having different talks relating to this topic throughout the summer. And I believe we also have a couple of local tattoo artists that are scheduled to come in and do tattoos in the museum on a couple of different days throughout the summer. Um, the man here, if you don't recognize him, uh, this is the Danish King Frederick the Ninth. He was born in 1899 and he reigned in Denmark from 1947 until 1972. Uh, he had quite a few tattoos and he was very proud of them. Uh, one interesting fact also is that the oldest continuously open tattoo shop in the world is called Tattoo Ole and it is in Copenhagen and it opened around 1884. So this other exhibit, it's the Roger Nielsen uh, Celebrating My Heritage. It's a collection of paintings illustrating the pride and love the artist has for his relatives, both past and present. Viewers will see a variety of family portraits referenced from old faded pictures, as well as uh, from life and current photos. There are scenes of his father's birth farm, landscapes um, from photos he took on his trips to Denmark, and he has also paid tribute to the Skagen painters and the golden age of Danish painting. Uh, Roger's style of painting varies from loose and sketchy to more refined and detailed. He approached each painting as a new challenge and he continues to grow with each venture. So that will run from June 25th to November 4th. Um, and then in June, we do have our annual Sankhans Often celebration. Um, it's mid our midsummer. I think it's June 23rd. I'm not quite sure on that date, um, but it will be up on our the museum Facebook. And then next summer we have our 40th anniversary, which will be a big celebration um, during the summer also. And so, oh, and then finally, this um, exhibit takes you to the great outdoors. As you walk along the paths in the Jens Jensen Landscape Park, uh, you can treat yourself to one of Louis, Louis Jensen's square stories. 
Um, Lewis Jensen passed away in 2021. At, he was around 78. And he had set out to create 1001 square stories, which are short works of fiction that are literally formatted in a square. Um, the project began in 1992, and the stories have a diverse range of themes and characters. They were originally published in Denmark, um, and Lisa Kildegard, who is a professor of English at Luther College in Decorah, Iowa, uh, has been working on translating the stories into English, and she has generously shared her translations with us for this installation, and it will run throughout the summer along, along the path. So. Um, and that's all I have. So if you're interested in visiting the genealogy center or the museum, um, our addresses are here and you're welcome to call or email if you have any questions or anything. And that's it. <laughs> okay, Amanda, I'm going to open up the floor to our, our, our attendees today. Anybody have a question for Amanda? Unmute your microphone. And while I'm waiting for anyone to, uh, to ask a question, I have a couple of questions. Um, I saw that you, you mentioned a contract number. What does that refer to? So they had to sign up with a, um, like a Danish agent when they were leaving. So that would be their contract to come over. And so that would be the number they were assigned. The family, if it was a family, they would all have that number. Um, It was, it's like their, like their paperwork, that's their contract they cite. <laughs> I don't know if that makes much sense. Uh, <laughs> Does that number follow them? Yes. So that would be how they would be if you, uh, identified through a family. So let's, I'm going to look one up. Now I will show you. Um, so. I take this contract number here. Whoops. Okay. Three two zero. There we go. That's that doesn't work. Three two zero three zero zero. Everything's freezing on me. Okay. And see, if he had family members now that he had traveled with, like a wife and kids, it would list all his family members that also traveled under that contract number because they would all have the same one. So I could see if, you know, his wife's name and his kids and all those. So I would know it wasn't just him that came over, it was all those. And see if uh, it was a teenager that came over, instead of knowing that he just came over at 18 alone, I could see he came with his parents and maybe a brother and sister. Does that make sense? So the head of household was assigned the contract number and then it was applied it's, automatically to everybody in the household. It's right, yep. It's whoever was the, the head of the household at the time or just whoever was traveling. If you're traveling alone, then you got it. And if you're traveling at the family, then the head of the household got it. Great, okay, now I understand. Yeah. And I noticed that in one of the books that you were showing us, the ones that were in color, I noticed oh. if, I, if I was reading the dates correctly, it was, it was in the 1600s, is that correct? Yes, that one, yeah. It, some of them do go back to the 1600s, and they can be legible. Some of them only go back to the 1700s. Um, they can they can be hit or miss with the legibility. <laughs> um, it it's sometimes you get really lucky, like that one that I had brought up. That was that was actually quite pretty. It was a little hard to read, but it was actually quite pretty. This is another one that actually is quite nicely organized and. It's the late 1700s, but it's actually quite pretty. Um, but a lot of times you'll get like water stains or it's just a big old, big old black mess and you can't quite read them. 
but it, it'll just depend on the parish, um, on the county, if they were taking uh, information at that time or if they're available. So each county has different, different books available. So yeah, let's see if I can find one that'll have an older one. See, I, you can see, I'm pointing like you can see my hand. Uh, like this only goes back to the 1800s. Um, this one goes back to 1643. So it's going to be, oh, it's actually kind of nicely arranged. It's not always the neatest handwriting, but it's actually nicely arranged. And then, and then sometimes you just get kind of word walls. And it can be kind of hard to read through, but actually, it's not really not that bad. 1667. So, yeah. That is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> wow. That is incredible. <coughs> now, regarding your, your slides regarding the tattoos, I had no idea that, you know, Danish were had such a long standing tradition with tattoos. Yeah. It started out kind of with like the sailors and those kind of traditional tattoos and it it just kind of kept going and um, the picture of bring that back up. This gentleman that's tattooing actually he works and I believe owns the tattoo the Olay now or a tattoo shop and he tattooed that that silicone arm for us it's going to be in our exhibit and he did all the old styles you know the old like uh mariners tattoos and then kind of some of the newer styles and it's it's actually quite fascinating how uh just how it kind of progressed because you know when, when i think of scandinavian you kind of think of the ruinic and like what the Vikings might have, what you see on TV, but it actually wasn't really like that. It was like, like this king, the king has like a dragon on it, you know, you see what he had and it's just like, you wouldn't have expected that to be what he had in the early 1900s, but that's what they had. And then By the way, I out. think the king resembles Tony Randall. <laughs> <laughs> That's who I thought it was when I first saw the picture. <laughs> okay, now if somebody has a, a um, if somebody's interested out of the class to reach out to you, what are the steps to request research? You can go to the website and um, there is a tab on, um, if you go up to the home, it's under explore and then uh, there's genealogy and then you click on the translations and research and then it'll pop up, um, you know, to request a translation or to request research. And then you just click on the forms, download it, fill out the information. And then you can either email it in or, you know, send it through the mail. And it has information about how to pay and all that kind of stuff. Um, or, you know, you can just email me or call me and we can do it over the phone or, we're just, we're trying to get, um, we currently cannot do it online, but we're in the works of getting that added so you can pay online. We just haven't quite got that far yet, but we're, it's in the process, <laughs> so. And what, you know, what kind of prep work should they do before they reach out to you? Write down as much as you can. So anything, you know, we want uh, dates, you know, anything about your ancestors. So if you have, his um, name, full name, his birthday, his where he was born, um, wife, parents, if you have it, just anything as much as you can get about your person. Um, even you know if they have, if you know the brothers and sisters, because that help does help us track down records on on your person. Because sometimes we can't always find a record, you know, if the immigrant came over and joined a brother over here, 
he might not have uh, be in instances on his own. He might be living with his brother at the time. So if we know that brother's name and know to look for that brother, we might be able to find your, you know, your ancestor living in that household with him. Um, <clears throat> and then, you know, knowing that that is his brother, we can kind of verify that information. So really just write down as much as you know and, and send it in. So, and locations, wherever they live, that's important too. So, and of course they don't have to have settled in Iowa. They could be in Wisconsin oh, yeah. or anywhere for you to research them. Yeah, we've, we've had people with, uh, from Washington, New York. I just finished one for um, a family in Atlanta. Uh, we have done work for people actually in Denmark. Um, so we do get requests from all around the world to do some research. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Denise, do you have a question? Um, yeah. Uh, how do you know when they change the EN to an ON, it, which is the correct way to do it? EN is the the Danish way. It usually got changed to ON when they came over. Yeah. So the EN is the original spelling. So if you're researching, do you follow the EN or the ON? EN. Okay. In America, it might be under the ON, but once you hit Denmark, it's going to be in the EN. Okay. Because I know somewhere along the line, my family changed it from the, the EN that it was to the ON that they changed it to when they first got here. Mm -hmm. And then somewhere they changed it back to the EN. Okay. Okay. So I've kind of got both going and it's a little confusing, but I do have both um, my great grandmother's birth certi or death certificate and my great grandfather's death certificate. And okay. shows when they came in and what their parents' names were. So that kind of gives me a little bit to go on. Yeah. And if you're, if you're finding those names on the census, if that's where you're pulling them from, those spellings are sometimes based on just what the census people wrote. <laughs> yeah. Because, I, in genealogy, know, you should never... <laughs> spelling of a last name does not matter. Yeah. It really yeah. doesn't. Yeah. Because my name, my last name is all E's, but I have found in the records where it's spelled with all I's, you know, my name is SK, I spelled it, I seen it spelled SCA. So it's kind of, it's, it was really kind of up to how they wanted to spell it yeah. sometimes. Well, sorry, I've got oh. a cold. Um, okay. They've also changed her name from K-A-A-E to K-A-A-L. So would I search both? Wait, say that again? Um, my great, or great, great grandmother, I guess, would be her last, her father's last name was Larson Kale, K-A, to K-A-A-L. But when she immigrated here, they have it as K A A E. Um, so two A's and an E. Yeah. That could be transcription error. Yeah. Is that on the original document? It could be an L. It just looks like an E. Yeah, I'm thinking. I that I think that's what yeah. happened. Um, um. Well, I'm looking at her death certificate, and it has her father as Larson Kale. And then when on her husband's death certificate, it has her as K-A-A-E. Okay. So it's, Again, it's death certificates are made by somebody, they interview somebody for those answers. Okay. And if it, finding a mistake on a death certificate is not unusual. Right. So okay. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't stress over it. Okay. Yeah, I, I would just, go with the I was L. Just kind of curious. Yeah, I'd go with the L. Okay. Yep. Thank you. You're welcome. Marlene, did you have a question? Yes. In the file cabinets where you have the immigration records and then the biographies of the family, so to speak. Sure. 
what is the early state on those immigration records? What do you mean? When was the first immigration that's in those file cabinets? Oh, um, uh, is it in the 1800s? Yeah, oh, oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, we have people coming over in probably the early 1850s. Um, yeah, um, I can't tell you exactly when. I mean, there we have um, individuals who came over like with the Norman or not Norman, the Mormon migration, and that was in the 18, 1850s, late 1840s. Okay. Uh, it, it's too recent for me. My Danish ancestor came in 1663. Um, uh, to the New Netherland colony? Uh, sort of, to the, probably to the, uh, the Delaware River with the oh. Swedish company. Oh, okay. Do you have any information on the Swedish company? I don't. Um, no, I don't actually. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, the Swedish company brought two boatloads of settlers to the Delaware River okay. in 1663. One lot arrived in July and the other one in November. Now, these, uh, the, the passengers, the colonists who came on those, those ships were not all of one place. They were a collection of people from all over around the Baltic. Uh -huh. And, uh, I have reason to believe that my ancestor was one of those settlers, mainly because he says he arrived in 1663. Okay. But, but I wondered if you had any information on that. Uh, we know the general area of Denmark where he came from, but w when I've tried to look for a possible birth record, which I would imagine is, let's say, between 1630 and 1650, uh probably around 1640 i can't find anything or there are too many people named mathis cornelius and for me to be able to pick out one and say that maybe that's him do you know where he might have come from i'm pretty sure he came from horn yoring uh jutland because we're named van horn and because dna testing has shown that that there are other people who live in that vicinity that have his same uh, Y DNA. Okay. Hmm. So uh, now you have me curious. <laughs> you said, I can pull that up real quick. Oh, strong one. You said, where in your ring? Horn. Horn? Mm -hmm. I can see if the books will go back that far. Oh, no, they only go back to 1732. Yeah, that's what I was afraid of. Um, the only thing I could say is maybe, maybe there's books over there that have not been digitized and contact um, the district um over there i don't know if it would be a library or something or a genealogist and see if there are still records over there that go back further okay um but what's what's on here is just it just goes back to 1732 yeah all right sorry thank you <laughs> now there's a question in the chat box uh from bill he wants to know um are all the archive sites that you showed us freely accessible yes yep they're, you can access them just like I did, just going to the website. And like I said, uh, if you're looking at those handouts digitally, I linked them all. So all you should have to do is click on either the name or the icon, and it'll take you straight to these websites that just how I pulled them up. So they're all free. All the Danish ones are free. Wonderful. Okay. The, only, the only one that I have put on, I think, actually, I don't know if I put any of them that are paid for. 
And the only ones we use that are subscription are the Ancestry and the newspapers.com. Um, otherwise, the rest are freely accessible. So, yeah. This is just a comment. Sure. Uh, you know, about the tattoos. Sure. Do you suppose the Danes developed a, a history of tattooing? Because many of them were seafarers. And if they were in a, a, an ocean accident and drowned and their body washed up, they could be identified by their tattoos. Uh, I, I mentioned that because you know the Irish fisherman sweaters? Yeah. Well, those are all distinctive and they were for that purpose because if they uh, got washed overboard and drowned and their body washed up, the body could be identified from the pattern on the sweater. That's a possibility. I, I, I haven't seen any of the information for the, the exhibit. Um, I've just seen some of the pictures. So I don't know if it kind of explains that or not yet. I'm, this is actually one that I'm really looking forward to because <laughs> uh, I think it's interesting. So, um, but I haven't been able to actually see it yet because they're in the process of kind of putting it up right now. Um, but that, that is a possibility. I mean, really, because it, it did start with all the seafaring stuff. So, yeah. Interesting. Very yeah. interesting. You know, it seems to me, I remember reading something on in one of the genealogy magazines on tattoos and genealogy. I'll have yeah. to go back and look at that. Um, if you get our, if anybody gets our um, America letter, I believe there our curator um, wrote a big article about the tattooing and the history of it. So if you get that, you might have read that. And I think the talk, the talk that's coming up or one of the lectures is from the curator that did it for Westerheim, the doctor, um, Lars, no, let me check his name again. Um, um, uh. The Danes and Northmen, basically, they had a tradition of tattooing that had a lot to do with magic and yeah. gaining power and looking threatening. That's <laughs> pretty much where it came from. One of our talks is with Dr. Lars Krutak, and I want to say it's on June um, 10th. And I'm not sure if it's going to be live streamed or not. Uh, you can check on our Facebook and it should be up there. But he is, he's been studying tattoos and the history of tattoos in different, different cultures all around the world. Um, so he should be discussing, you know, kind of all this stuff. And he's the one that helped Westerheim and Decora kind of help put this together and get um, all the information for their part of it put together. So he would, I think he would be a very interesting person to listen to if you're interested in any of this. So, yeah. Amanda, can you show us how to show, sign up for the newsletter? Um, if, if the newsletter, <laughs> let's see. <laughs> Here's our website. <laughs> um, I'm not entirely. Is it horrible that I'm not entirely sure? Okay. Not entirely sure, but I'm sure it's on here. <laughs> but if you go to our Facebook, uh, if you actually, you know what? If you just sign up here and you click the email and you say you want to sign up for a newsletter, they'll sign you up. They'll put your information in and you'll get signed up. Um, and is there a link off your web page to get to Facebook? There should be down at the bottom. Yep. Perfect. And then, so our events are here. Um, and it has our tattoo coming up. Uh, oh, yeah, it is June 10th for our lecture. Um, and then we do have a, a exhibit going right now Go that's through the end of the month for paperclip. It's um, paper art. Uh, 
it's actually kind of cool, but it's the different cultures that how they do paper art. Um, I don't know how to explain it. <laughs> Mike, our curator explains all this stuff way better than her than I do, but um, but there's a lot of interesting stuff on our on our um, uh, Facebook page. We also have a YouTube channel where we post our, we had to do brown bag lunches um, and we post all of those videos there. So if you miss a talk, then it should be accessible there. Um, why isn't this coming up? We also have a, a, a channel, New Nordic Cuisine, um, which we have about you know recipes. We have information about different Nordic foods um, and how we just have a, a, just a lot of different things on that. We had a, a large, it's a traveling exhibit right now called New Nordic Cuisine and it's been going around the country. And so it's a part of that. And I'm not sure where it is right now, but we keep adding different um, videos to that channel to keep it going. So if anybody wants to check that out, you're welcome to do that also. So. Great. Okay. Well, I'll give the class one last chance for uh, any questions. Let me just scroll through the uh, people who are here, make sure nobody else has their hand up here. Hold on. No. So if uh, anybody else has a question, just please unmute your mic and, and go ahead and ask. Okay. Well, before I say goodbye, um, Amanda, I want to remind everybody that um, class does go on for about another hour, hour and a half. Uh, and we'd love for everyone to stay. Uh, however, if you would like to leave at this point in time, all you have to do is click on the red in button and that'll take you out of today's session. But if there's anything in the chat box that you wanna download before you leave, please do so. Because once again, if you leave and uh, decide that you want the chat box and you log back in, it won't be there. So uh, please download anything you want before you leave. And with that, Amanda, I'll say thank you very much for a wonderful, outstanding webinar. And, uh, and thank you also for letting us record today. And it'll take a couple weeks before our marketing department gets it up on our YouTube channel. But I will notify you when that happens. And um, I actually have a few follow-up questions about the technology you used today. Um, there were some things that I really admired. So I will send you a, an email separately from, from the recording and right. uh, we can discuss that further. So okay. uh, thank you, Amanda. And if you would like to stay for the next part of class, you're welcome to. If not, you can just click on the red end button. All right, thank you. All right, thank you. All right, thanks.